Yeah, exactly. Well, I think we can jump into some of these topics that we we're hoping to discuss today because sure. um, I, I think they will be very helpful. And, and there were sort of three main ones I wanted to discuss, and then we'll get into some other things as well. But the first thing was vitamin D uh, uh, toxicity, basically, which kind of runs under different names, you know, overdose, yeah. vitamin D overdose or yeah. um, hypervitaminosis and whatnot. This is something that I feel like not a lot, or maybe I think more keepers are becoming more aware of it now, but it's something that's almost new in, in terms of the reptile industry, just sort of by virtue of supplementations and whatnot. So maybe we can talk just a little bit about that. Yeah, I think um, I think it's been around and happening probably a lot longer than we were aware. Um, but vet med was kind of behind for a little while. So a, a lot of people were keeping reptiles for a lot longer than there was available veterinary care. So we just didn't know that it was something that was happening. Yeah, so just to kind of break down what it is, it's... Um... I guess for the most part, the reason that this is happening, I guess really the only reason that's happening is because synthetic vitamin D is a common supp supplement in the industry, and that's Correct. being paired with, with UVB lighting. Is that the main issue? Yeah. I mean, the main issue is really the UV lighting doesn't have a whole lot to do with it. They, you can expose them to as much UVB uh, light as, as um, you want, and their bodies will stop processing you know, they have a fail safe mechanism. It's when we supply synthetic vitamin D that the problem happens. Right. And yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I had speculated was, you know, as the hobby started to evolve, and we started realizing the importance of vitamin D and the importance of providing UVB, people are still, uh, like you said, you can't overdose vitamin D through the UVB. But if you're providing, if you're still providing the, the synthetic vitamin D, then that's obviously a problem. So what are some of the symptoms that, that people can watch for in terms of so what this causes? So uh, unfortunately, there's nothing very, you know, there's not one thing that says, hey, this is hypervitaminosis D. It's kind of a general, you know, grouping of findings. But usually by the time they come in to see me, um, they're, they're anorexic, they're lethargic. Some keepers will notice that they're producing more liquid urine than, than is normal for them. Um, but generally, it's just kind of a, an overall malaise or they just seem off. Hmm. Is it something that you're commonly seeing brought into the clinic? I, it's not super common. Uh, and I think that's more because people aren't bringing them into the clinic. I think right. it probably is more common than I am aware of. I think a very small subsection of people will actually bring their reptile into the vet. So probably it's happening more often than we even know about. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And in terms of the actual mechanism of what is happening, maybe we could chat just a little bit about that. When you're, the animals are given vitamin D, okay, I guess the other important thing to note is that you can't really overdose on calcium either, or you can't overdose a, an animal on calcium. Not really. You, theoretically, you could, but I think you would have to really try hard. I don't think you could, you know, you could give an animal too much calcium. Um, you know, you would have to be like spooning them tons of calcium supplement or something. So just by dusting your, your, your feeders or something, no, you're not going to overdose with calcium. But I guess the, and the issue really arises with the excess of vitamin D. Yeah. So the vitamin D, um, Usually what happens is the ex excess vitamin D causes calcification of the organs. Uh, and that varies based on the amount and the species that you're talking about. But usually it's the kidneys and they will literally start turning to stone. They, they calcify. And so they get kidney failure. Um, but any of the organs can calcify. And I found calcified livers. Um, you'll find streaks of, of calcium in the intestines and things like that. So basically, they, they turn to stone and the organs don't function like they're supposed to anymore. So is it their, so their bodies just continue to retain the calcium that they're ingesting because of the high levels of vitamin D in their body? Correct. So normally, the, they have cells in their skin that produce a, a precursor to vitamin D and the UV light hits that. Uh, and converts it. And it goes through several conversions until you have what we, we think of as vitamin D. Um, and it's distributed in the liver and throughout the body and does its thing. Um, and the, as long as the vitamin D is there, it tells the intestines 
to absorb calcium. Um, and so normally, you know, you would have a, a cutoff. It wouldn't be producing all that vitamin D all day because of the sun setting and, you know, them coming in and out of basking. So there'd be a break. And so while this vitamin D is, is in there, they just continue uh, absorbing calcium. And so they have to send it somewhere. And so they distribute it throughout the body and it just ends up building up. Yeah. And I assume once the organs start to calcify, that's not something you can really reverse. It's probably something you can just manage or? Yeah, you can. If you find it really early, you can stop it, but you can't fix what is already calcified. Um, so you can give them some some medications that can help uh, pull all of that calcium out. Um, but it's not usually very effective. Usually by the time we see them, they're so far gone, there's not a whole lot that we can do. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That's sort of the this sort of the, how most reptiles go as soon as they start showing illness, it's it's kind of too late in a lot of ways. Correct. Yeah. By the time you notice, they've probably been sick for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so with the, oh, I was going to, oh yeah, yeah. With, with the calcium, with the hyper, because this would be almost symptoms of hypercalcemia. And I, I know one of the interesting things about it is it, it's sort of this symptomatic of also hypocalcemia. So sometimes people miss the diagnosis of having too much calcium when, because the symptoms are so similar to, you know, what you might see in an animal that's not getting enough calcium. Yeah. Sometimes, um, you know, again, there, it's not a very specific finding. Most of the things that make reptiles sick, they all sort of present the same way. Right. Um, so it's really hard to differentiate exactly what's going on. You can't just, uh, bring a reptile in for an exam and have a list of symptoms. And we can't really know for sure unless we actually get some blood and look at the levels. Um, that's the only way to have an actual diagnosis. Otherwise, most of the time we can make an educated guess based on our exam and husbandry information. Um, but really we have to look at, at, at the, the levels in the blood to make an accurate diagnosis. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And so in terms of the actual industry, the, the, the companies that are providing this, uh, the supplements and whatnot, do you, do you have, like, do you have a preference of where they should go? Like, do you think synthetic vitamin D should be slowly removed as long as UVB is being promoted? It's kind of a slippery slope in some ways. I know. I think our problem is in the beginning, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago when reptiles were really starting to become popular, we sort of had an idea that they needed um, calcium and vitamin D. And we sort of knew that they got uh, vitamin D from the sun, but didn't really understand the process. And we didn't have the technology to have a bunch of UV bulbs and things like we do now. So logically, we assumed we'll just supply it in the diet. And so that kind of caught on. And then slowly, as we understood more, I think the industry caught up and started producing UV lights and other things but never went back and addressed the fact that now we have this synthetic vitamin D in everything. Uh, and, and I think it's tough because, you know, it's a moneymaker and they want to sell a bunch of stuff. So it's hard for them to voluntarily say, Hey, we found out this isn't so good. You know, we should educate people or pull it from the shelves. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely tricky because then if you pull it from the shelves, people who aren't using UVB are going to create MBD. And it's right. yeah, it's, it's definitely, I, I was actually the podcast that I released this morning, I was talking to to the gentleman, we, he was saying that I think it was Zoomed sells, you know, a, um, a chameleon kit and it comes with UVB lighting and vitamin D yeah. calcium supplement. And, and that's just, that's brutal. It's, it's yeah. almost like they didn't think about it far enough down the road to realize that it's they're actually selling poison in, in that case. Yeah, they, they didn't think about it. And also, I think in exotic husbandry and the reptile community more specifically, things become kind of dogma or they, they just become like this accepted thing. Everybody knows you need vitamin D. And that's just kind of the way it is. And everybody just knows that it's a fact. And we never kind of moved beyond that. And so, it, you know, it's kind of like everybody thinks birds eat seeds. So every time you buy a bird, you buy seeds. But really, right. that's incorrect. But it's hard for people to stop because we have generations of people giving vitamin D to their reptiles. And when you have somebody say, hey, you shouldn't do that, I think they're a little suspicious because that's what everybody has been doing. Everybody knows that. And now why is this person saying otherwise? Right. So I guess in terms of people listening, um, for just some tools they can have in their mind, if you're providing 
UV light and consistently updating your bulbs, is there any need for synthetic vitamin D ever? No. Okay. So no, you if just... you, yeah, if they have the correct bulbs um, and they're the correct distance from the enclosure and you've taken everything else like that into consideration, the reptile will produce its own vitamin D and has no need for exogenous synthetics at all. And like you said earlier, the, when, when they're producing their own vitamin D, it is so much healthier because there's no chance of overdosing and it's actually going through the, the biological mechanics that it's supposed to. Right. They, they cannot overdose because they're, they're, they have feedback mechanisms that uh, update their bodies with how much is in the system. Um, and they will either stop basking or they can just shut down production themselves. So it's much easier really to let them do their own thing and not worry about supplying it. Right. So really the only people that should be using th synthetic vitamin D is if you're not providing UVB. Correct. If you do not have UVB, um, you should be providing. But I think everybody, I think all reptiles should have access to UV lighting. Yeah. And that would simplify things uh, a lot, really. A lot. Tons. Yeah. It would be much easier. And uh, so one of the areas that I, I want people to, to listen to is that a lot of crested gecko diets have synthetic vitamin D. And it's just mixed into this general powder. And for example, my crested gecko, he eats Pangea. And then that's really what he only eats. I'm slowly trying to move him to a different food because he does have UVB lighting now. Luckily, since he's nocturnal, it's probably not as much of a risk. Maybe maybe you would have an answer to that. But but now he's he has he's kind of getting both at this point. And I can probably pull off the synthetic vitamin D completely, even though he is nocturnal. Right. I, yeah, so that's another hard thing is um, something like crested geckos, Again, it's, you know, everybody knows that crested geckos don't need UV light. So they've just been feeding things like Pangea uh, and it has everything in it and everybody thinks they've been doing okay. But really, even nocturnal animals or crepuscular animals still need UV light and they still process it um, whether, we want, whether we want to supply it or not. You know, naturally, they, they just do better with it. But it's hard when you know, what else is there to feed a crested gecko? There's only so many commercial diets available. And I think all of them have vitamin D. Um, you know, there's also, I think we overfeed some of those commercial diets. I, I think we need to feed more insect prey to them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. You know, but uh, that's also another thing that's very difficult to overcome. Yeah, no, definitely, because it's so simple, right? You got the powder right. and they're good to go. And, and uh, Arcadia Reptile does sell, their Crested Gecko, crested gecko Diet does not have vitamin D in it. So if anyone's oh, listening, and it, although I've, I've found my gecko has been fairly reluctant to eat it, so that, that's another challenge. But, yeah. but still, that will be my goal in the end. And I think 